Studio here in New York City. I'm Josh Lipton alongside Alexandra Canal today. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here's what we're watching this afternoon. We are an hour away from the close on Wall Street, and stocks are fighting for gains here. The market showing signs of calm after yesterday's big sell off on the heels of that hot January CPI report. We're tracking all the action in this final hour of trading. Plus, the hot new trend in corporate America, share buybacks. Uber, the latest company to make the move, and the stock is soaring. We've got a closer look at why buybacks are making a comeback. And sticking with ride train, Lyft shares are flying high in today's trade. The stock hitting a 52-week high on earnings last night, and the results overshadowing now. Confusion sparked by that typo in its earnings release. I'm going to sit down with Lyft CEO David Risher with his take on that error and how the company is now turning things around. All right, let's do a quick check on, on the markets here, Allie. Major averages, try for a rebound today after that sell-off we saw yesterday. Let's take a look here. The Dow up about a tenth of a percent. The S&P 500 is up about six tenths of a percent. Tech-heavy Nasdaq, we took it on the chin yesterday. Today, it's about nine tenths of a percent. We hired that, of course, yesterday, that hotter than expected January CPI print, and that caused some uncertainty, what it meant for the Fed, though perhaps Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby kind of going out there and calming some of those jitters alley today saying mm -hmm. basically listen let's not make too much of one month of CPA CPI coming higher than we thought one month does not a trend make he seemed to imply and you can kind of see uh, the common treasuries here today too yields calmer in today's trade after that that surge we saw yesterday yeah certainly nice to see some green after that big sell-off here but we're bringing you Yahoo Finance team coverage of the biggest moves impacting the market in today's trade we're joined by Josh Schaefer Jennifer Schomberger and Jared Blickery let's kick it off with Jared on the latest moves from the Magnificent Seven. Allie, we can see broad gains today, though not Apple. That's down 1%. Alphabet has been flirting with the unchanged, both green and red, for an hour or so. NVIDIA up to another record, 1.4%. But I want to take a look at the market cap because NVIDIA over the last two days has briefly, from time to time, surpassed Alphabet in market cap. They're both about $1.8 uh, trillion right now, so both shy of $2 trillion. And NVIDIA recently passed past Amazon as well. Google, by the way, Alphabet, one of three companies to reach that three trillion, or excuse me, $2 trillion mark so far. I'm also throwing Bitcoin in here. Bitcoin's worth a trillion dollars and just want to get a quick update on the technicals here. We are at past 50,000, at 51,000 and a half basically in territory we have not seen since late 2021. But the overarching theme today is mega caps are definitely in focus and do not count out the mag seven. Now let's send it over to Jennifer Schonberger with the latest commentary from Fed officials. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby soothing market fears today over that hotter than expected January CPI report, saying the Fed still intends to cut rates multiple times this year. Goolsby saying, quote, let's not get amped up over one month of CPI that was higher than expected. We can still be on the path even mm -hmm. if we have some ups and increases and some, some ups and downs. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. So let's, let's not get too flipped out. Goolsby also pointed to the fact that Fed officials see inflation of 2.4% this year. That's actually higher than the data that we've seen over the past six months. And at that higher level of inflation, Goolsby says he still expects the Fed to cut multiple times this year. Now let's kick it over to Josh Schaefer for the latest on the earnings roundup. Josh? Thanks, Jen. Fourth quarter earnings season well underway, and a few key themes have emerged. First, buybacks. Uh, Uber unveiling its first ever buyback, totaling $7 billion, sending shares soaring today, and Airbnb, Disney, Alibaba, and Meta, among others, announcing repurchase plans in their quarterly reports. Also getting a lot of mention, layoffs. Meta set the trend in 2023 with its year of efficiency, and the trend is clearly catching on. Uh, though job cuts historically tend to rise in January, big names across media and tech have been making headlines with plans to streamline and slim down staff. And finally, inflation. This week's hotter than expected CPI print, raising concerns about progress made in the inflation fight. Names in the food and alcohol space like Krispy Kreme and Heineken calling out inflation's impact on pricing. So, Ali and Josh, not necessarily 
shocking themes here, I would argue, the fact that we're still talking about inflation, we're still talking about layoffs. But one that does stand out to me because it is a little bit of a different trend than we had been seeing is buybacks. Mm. We have earnings coming up, right? We have earnings increasing again for the second straight quarter on a year-over-year basis. You often see buybacks come with that, and we hadn't really seen the buyback resurgence yet, but it seems like we're starting to see that a little bit right now, Allie. Go, yeah. Go ahead, Allie. No, yeah, I was going to say, some of these stats are interesting. The last three weeks have seen nearly $130 billion in buyback announcements. Goldman Sachs also had some separate research that for the fourth quarter, S&P 500 companies are set to increase buybacks by about 6%. And it's just been interesting to see the reaction in some of these stocks. I covered Disney very mm. closely, and when they announced their buyback, that was one of the reasons why we mm. saw that stock surge. Along with buybacks, you're also having dividends. A lot of these things is what investors want to see. But I know, Josh, we were all talking about yeah. how it's an interesting time for all of this yeah. to happen. Interest yeah. rates are high, borrowing costs are high. A lot of these companies seem to be under a lot of pressure, yet here they are, the stock buyback is back. Yeah, I mean, they've been, they've been making news, we're talking about, Josh, mm -hmm. and that, you know, capital turners from Meta and Airbnb and Uber. But it was interesting whether you saw kind of differences between sectors, because I, we were talking off camera about this, how I would think a lot of CFOs are still thinking, you know, given corporate borrowing costs, mm -hmm. given all all the uncertainty about the macro still, I think a lot of them are thinking, you know what, I'm going to hold on to my cash for a while. And that is what strategists have pointed to leading into earnings season, right, was this is why we haven't seen the return in buybacks yet, or at least the normal level of buybacks that you would see is those concerns you listed, Josh, right? But you see communication services leading buybacks thus far this earnings season, and what stands out to me there is you think of a company like Meta, right? And yeah. you think about what Meta was able to do in the last year by getting basically their capital structure in a better situation, they feel, and it's increased margins, it's increased earnings, and eventually you end up with more cash, right? And what do you do with that cash when you feel like you're in a better position and you might not necessarily need it? You can go to share buybacks. So I think we're seeing it from some of these top companies. We already mentioned Disney, right? Mm -hmm. We mentioned Meta. Now you have Uber also feeling, feeling like they're in a better spot over the last year. We know that's been a big turnaround story. So it's sort of those leaders of the quote unquote, year of efficiency. We're using Meta's word for everyone now. But I think yeah. it's the leaders of that year of efficiency, right, and finding the right structure. Maybe yeah. the last piece of that is the buybacks. And I think maybe the broader question yeah. is, when do you start seeing it across more sectors? Yeah, Zuckerberg really should have trademarked the year of efficiency. I know. It's we, really I, I thought we did this last year. We should add a t-shirt. No, it's a bumper sticker. Yeah. Exactly, but I want to pick up on that efficiency point because this is a cool chart that I want to bring up. Morgan Stanley analyst Mike Wilson, he said that transcript mentions of operational efficiency are at historic levels as these companies are really focusing in on profitability. You mentioned, Josh, the layoffs that we've seen, Instacart, Paramount Global, two recent examples here. And a big part of this, too, is the refocus on AI, or I should say, you know, new focus on AI. So they're really trying to trim their business to focus their cash on that. And with that, unfortunately, it tends to come layoffs. And the, and the other thing with operational efficiency, too, that always comes to mind for me, because we've been talking a lot about the Fed and are we going to see these rates go higher for longer? Are they going to wait till May? Are they going to wait till June? When you think about what that means for these companies, and Josh, you mentioned borrowing costs being yeah. higher. So borrowing costs go up. Typically, you see layoffs because companies are trying to protect their margins, right? They need somewhere to basically get money back. And we haven't seen necessarily mass layoffs, and that's the broad question, it seems like, for the market right now. If those borrowing costs do stay high, mm. how much more do we hear mentions of layoffs as companies try to protect margin? Because you know, there's, only, there's only so many things you can do, right? And that's yeah. sort of the last straw sometimes that companies go to, to basically say, all right, well, we got to cut costs somewhere. It might have to be in the labor force. All right, we'll keep watching. Joshua, yeah. thank you. All right, our thanks to Jared and Jennifer, too, by the way. We move on for a deeper dive on what's next for Jerome Powell and the Fed and the market. Let's welcome in David Sakara, Morningstar Chief U.S. Market Strategist. David, it is good to have you on the show. Interested, David, just start a high level. Where do you think we are with this, this market, David? You know, uh, we did see that sell-off yesterday. There were, there were plenty of, of folks, David, you know, strategists, technicians, who were saying, given the rally we've seen, David, not to say they're bearish on the market, but they have been looking for kind of a near-term pullback here. Is that what you see? David, and kind of near to intermediate term here. 
That is what I see, that this was just a short-term pullback, you know, based on the CPI data that came out yesterday. And in fact, when you look at that CPI data, you know, our U.S. economics team you know, specifically came out you know, and told people, you know, not to panic, you know, when that headline, you know, hit the screen. But generally, I'd say, you know, the broad U.S. equity market is trading you know, just slightly above, you know, our fair value estimate right now. Yeah, you know, we are expecting a slowing rate of economic growth. So I do think that's going to weigh on earnings growth over the next couple of quarters. But then we also expect, you know, interest rates to subside over the remainder of the year. So between, you know, those two expectations, market pretty fairly valued. But I do think there's a lot of ways that you can position your portfolios today to be able to take advantage of, you know, some of those areas that do remain undervalued and then steer clear, you know, some of those areas that are just, you know, significantly overvalued today. So, David, what are some of the areas in the market that you believe are undervalued mm -hmm. right now? You know, a couple of different sectors uh, that we like. Uh, real estate is one. Of course, it's certainly been under a lot of pressure, you know, last year and this year as well. You know, we just see a lot of areas there that have gotten pushed down, you know, too much. And so when we think about interest rates, you know, coming down, according to our forecast over the course of this year, I think that's going to give a pretty good tailwind for real estate. So one stock there, our team really likes as realty income, you know, ticker O, trades at a 32% discount to our fair value, has a 6% dividend yield right now. It's a five-star rated stock. And this is one that, according to our team, has actually the most sensitivity to interest rates. So as interest rates come down, that would be one certainly to watch. And then for people that might be looking for more defensive picks, you know, in the real estate area, I'd, I'd call it Health Peak. Uh, it's again, you know, medical offices and other healthcare facilities. Another five-star rated stock trades at almost half of our fair value estimate. Pays a 7.2% dividend yield. You know, some other areas I'd look at would be basic materials and utilities. And David, just come back to, to real estate for a second. I want to get your thoughts on the commercial real estate sector. And certainly, uh, Dave, you know, NYCB, New York, uh, Community mm -hmm. Bank Corps making headlines for all the wrong reasons there. Any concern yeah. you have, David, that, you know, that, that sector, the problems are going to kind of mm -hmm. impact the broader banking system, the broader economy? Or do you think, and this does seem to be consensus right now to some degree, that NYCB's problems were its own, idiosyncratic? Yeah, now we don't cover New York Community Bank, but I know our team did take a quick look at it just to see whether or not there were implications for the rest of our U.S. bank coverage, specifically the regionals. And we do think it was really idiosyncratic to New York Community Bank based on the type of real estate and where that real estate was located that they were financing and just how much real estate exposure they had as compared to their capital. So when we look at the U.S. regional banks, we still see a lot of value there for investors today. Of course, a lot of those stocks did get hit, you know, pretty hard earlier this month. Our go-to stock there has been U.S. Bank. You know, that's one we've been highlighting for a while. It's a four-star rated stock, trades at a 23% discount to fair value, and pays almost a 5% dividend yield. And David, taking a step back here, going back to that hotter than expected CPI print, there's been more mm -hmm. chatter when it comes to a no landing scenario for the economy. So mm -hmm. essentially, the economy would continue to grow, but we would not reach the Fed's 2% inflation target. How likely do you think that is and what sectors would be most exposed if that were to occur? Yeah, so the CPI print we don't think was nearly as bad as the headlines suggested. So when our U.S. economics team really got into it and started looking at the difference between you know, some of the weightings and some of the methodologies and CPI versus PCE, you know, we still continue to believe that PCE this year is going to average 1.9% and actually will even subside even further going into 2025. So we're not concerned about inflation. Our U.S. economics team actually is still looking for that first rate cut here in May. So I know that's a little out of consensus right now, but when you think about, you know, kind of the economy slowing over the next couple of quarters, thinking about, you know, interest rates coming down, inflation slowing, I think that gives the Fed the room that it's going to need in order to start cutting rates. The other thing, too, is, you know, while the Fed is very focused on inflation right now, they still have to keep in the back of their mind, you know, they don't want to keep rates, you know, too high for too long and accidentally cause a recession, you know, certainly in the potentially in the second half of this year. And Dan, I'll get you out of here on this question about earnings season. You know, we've heard from the big banks, we've heard mm -hmm. from big tech, David. Still got some big ones in the pipeline. We've got Cisco today after, after the bell. What have been your big takeaways from this earnings season, Dave? What have you learned? And, and what, by the way, do you expect for co corporate profit growth in the quarters ahead? 
Yeah, so I think things are actually shaping up pretty well for the beginning of this year. You know, the economy, you know, did hold up much better in the second half of last year. It looks like it's actually holding up pretty well in the first quarter of this year. I think the biggest takeaway from earnings for me is, you know, my biggest concern coming into it was that management teams might use this as an opportunity to try and lower the bar for guidance this year, just so that it'd be you know, easier to outperform over the course of the year in kind of an environment where we expect a slowing economic rate of growth. And we didn't see that. And I think that's also a big reason, too, why we have seen the market do as well as it has this earnings season. David, it is always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, shares of Coinbase, they're jumping today ahead of earnings. We're gonna talk to an analyst on the other side about what to expect from the crypto exchange platform. And Lyft is riding higher on the back of a strong fourth quarter in 2024 guidance. We're joined by the CEO, David Risher, later in the hour to break down those numbers. Plus the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analyst insight to break down two stocks and help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned. More Yacht Finance after this.
We're checking in on a few trending tickers. Shares of Uber moving higher today after the ride-sharing giant announced that its board of directors has authorized the repurchase of up to $7 billion of the company's common stock. Uber's CFO calls its first-ever share repurchase program, quote, a vote of confidence in the company's strong financial momentum. And Josh, this is really an important moment for Uber. After years of burning cash, we saw positive results last week. Uber posting its first annual profit since its IPO. I also think the fact that we saw positive results from Lyft is helping lift that sentiment across the board since clearly there's room for both of these ride-sharing giants within the current market. At the same time, there, there's overhanging risks, right? We have strikes going on today with gig economy workers from Lyft, Uber, DoorDash as they're fighting for fair pay. But it really seems like Uber is in a solid position right now. For, yeah, for it, it, it is in a different financial position. You know, a lot of that change happening under CEO Dara Khosrow Shahi, mm -hmm. and he and he's spoken about this. How, you know, he's called 2023 called it an inflection point for the company. They report their first full year uh, profit as a as a public company. Um, you look at this stock really remarkable run. Yeah. I mean, we are now up about 120% over the last 12 months, and the street loves this name. It is like NVIDIA kind of love for mm -hmm. Uber. you got about 90% of analysts who cover this one still say, even after this run, this one is a buy. Mm -hmm. Moving on to another ticker trending higher in today's trailer. Check out shares of Zillow. They are rising as the online real estate company reporting a revenue beat for the fourth quarter, posting a 9% gain year over year on this one. So Zillow, stock has moved sharply higher here. Reports Q4 results beat consensus alley. Zillow also offered a forecast, which some of the industry actually thought was kind of conservative. Um, I thought one note from RBC was really interesting. They like this name, by the way. They still tell their clients they think it's a buy. They think given the rate volatility we're seeing, the market market probably softened near term versus a month ago, but they're still bullish. Bigger picture, they're telling their clients they're looking for further share gains. Could mean, they say, more meaningful margin expansion than the company's letting on. Yeah, I mean, beating earnings is a big deal for a company like Zillow, especially in this slow housing market. It's been quite a wild ride with interest rates still high. There's not a lot of inventory on the market, and the Fed's higher for longer mantra. That seems to be the case. It's certainly not going to help real estate moving forward, but there is some resiliency here in the results. CEO Rich Barton said looking forward in 2024, he's confident in new expanding into more markets and said, quote, the company plans to press on the accelerator. So yeah. they're not planning to stop anytime soon and that they barely scratch the surface when it comes to how much uh, the real estate market has and all the, the opportunities there. Uh, well, from home buying to buying products for your home. Shares of the Kraft Heinz company tanking today as the food company saw fourth quarter net sales fall short of expectations and declined 7.1% year over year. Now, the company blamed the revenue declines on food cost inflation with customers essentially trading down or not buying as much. And we have heard this narrative from a few food makers out there, many of which have raised prices to try and combat some of those inflationary pressures. Companies like Krispy Kreme, Coca-Cola, Heineken, all echoing that similar messaging this week that inflation is going to hurt uh, earnings and margins down the line. And then there's always a lingering question, right, Josh, of how much consumers are willing to pay when you raise prices. And it seems like we're finally getting that answer. They, they don't want to pay as much for their for their snacks and their yeah. sodas. <laughs> yeah, for fiscal 24, in terms of forecast, company says they're going to be looking for organic net sales growth. They call between zero to 2% versus the prior year. They expect positive contribution from price. Volumes, they did talk about, they see an inflation Inflection, uh, inflecting positive in the second half. But interesting note from the team of analysts at Bloomberg, they call this a lackluster end to fiscal 23 for the company. It seems like investors agree with that. And that expectations for that positive inflection and volume in the back half, um, they argue that could be tough to achieve. We'll see. Well, another top trading ticker on Yahoo Finance is Coinbase, Coinbase, that plus other crypto-related names, all shooting higher as Bitcoin briefly topped $52,000, bringing its total market cap back above $1 trillion. Joining us now is Devin Ryan, Director of Financial Technology Research at Citizens JMP. And Devin, I want to start you off on this price action. You would think riskier assets, especially after that hot inflation print, they turn lower. Why is Bitcoin so resilient right now? Well, I think it's just simplistically supply-demand dynamics. And the ETF 
Uh, we're still in the very early days, so I actually think demand could grow pretty materially or even exponentially from here. But there's been a lot of demand with the ETF coming in in recent weeks. And so I think we're in the kind of the first inning of that demand, though. Um, if you think about the, the sponsors of the ETF and you think about the tens of trillions of dollars of assets, the next wave is going to come when financial advisors actually allocate uh, to the asset class in a broader asset allocation plan. And that hasn't even really started yet. So I think this is kind of early, uh, you know, people getting in, early adopters, you know, small RIAs that are um, you know, putting in, uh, their, their clients' capital into Bitcoin. But I actually think that uh, as that expands out, you're going to see even more demand. So that's really, there's a, there's a uh, multiplier effect on capital. So as small amounts of capital come in, it pushes the valuation higher. And I think, again, we're in the early days of that. And these new these new spot Bitcoin ETFs, what do they kind of mean for Coinbase? So we, we had, I asked because we've had other analysts come on and say, you know, listen, it might be bad news for Armstrong and his team because to the extent that so many, some traders and investors might think, you know what, I want exposure to Bitcoin, I'll sidestep Coinbase. I'll just, I'll pile into these new these new shiny vehicles. Yeah, so I'd take the other side of that. I'll yeah. actually give you one stat. So Robinhood reported earnings last night. They said they, they offer all 11 of the uh, spot Bitcoin ETFs. They said that 95% of the volume that's happening in crypto is still happening in spot, not on the ETFs there, mm -hmm. because people want to own the spot. So what's happening with these ETFs is this incremental capital. You've essentially removed a barrier for a certain subset of investors to get access. These are financial advisors that are not going to move their customers' capital outside of the firm, uh, outside of their own custodian. Now they can custody it within the same platform. And so this is more capital from them coming in. And certain institutions want to own it in an ETF structure. And so it's the right wrapper for certain types of investors. People that are comfortable buying it in a spot form, which is really what the world has been up until January this year, those investors are going to continue to buy spot. And by the way, if you buy spot uh, e uh, Bitcoin and then you buy a Bitcoin ETF, I think that ultimately what happens is people then start looking at what other cryptocurrencies are out there. What is Ethereum? What are some of the other crypto cryptocurrencies that are not in an ETF wrapper? And so that's where, for a company like Coinbase, just more interest in the space, more adoption drives more activity. And I think that's what we're seeing. You're seeing huge volume. The volumes at Bitcoin are up, or excuse me, at Coinbase are up over 30% in the first quarter relative to where they were in the fourth quarter of uh, last year. Yeah, and Devin, you mentioned Robinhood, those positive earning res results. They did post a surprise Q4 profit, better than expected revenue. That included a 10% growth in cryptocurrencies revenue. So how does that factor into your expectations when Coinbase reports earnings tomorrow? Yeah, I think uh, there is some similarities. So I think people are more engaged in the market, and, and crypto uh, was one area for the fourth quarter that was very active. But I think you know, Robinhood, obviously, it's a broader platform around investing. And you know, they, they saw just in 2023, 37% revenue growth. At the same time, they got their expenses under control. So now this is a firm that is, is profitable. And so I think, like, in terms of uh, connectivity, Coinbase is doing a lot of the same things. They're reaccelerating their revenues, and they're also very focused on expenses. They reduced headcount earlier in the year, and so there's similarities there. Um, but Robinhood, you know, had a, a very successful end of 2023, and then give a very good outlook for 2024. And the stock is just cheap, and that's why it's moving today. It's been beaten down over the last year and a half. Now people are starting to come back to it. Five, five, 5.3 billion dollars of cash, which is half their market cap. Um, I mean, people are seeing value in that. And Devin, you know, its stocks had kind of, it's had about 10% so far this year, but to your point, I mean, you pull back the charts up 165% over the past 12 months. You have an outperform on the name, so a buy. What are the catalysts ahead, Devin, that you would tell viewers about that you think moves this one higher? Yeah, so it's actually, it's interesting, like this has become a fundamental story. So you go back two years, nobody was thinking Robinhood or firms like Robinhood that we're gonna, we're gonna get to profitability. Robinhood's actually now gap profitable, not just you know, fake earnings, it's gap profitability um, and they're very cash generative. So I think they can actually justify their valuation on real earnings. And so if we look at 2025, stock's trading at roughly seven times EV to EBITDA, which is very cheap for a company that can grow. So I think that as people look at the growth potential, revenue growth of this company, uh, they're going to get more excited. And that's actually what's happening today. So I think that will continue, uh, assuming they continue to execute, which is our, our you know, view for the company. And, and so Devin, so you're a believer, valuation you still, still looks attractive after this run. Before viewers pile in though, what, what are risks you, to your thesis? What are downside risks you got to think about? Yeah, I think that it's it's a little bit of engagement in, this, in, in investing. Investing has been very hard for the last two years. It's not just retail investors, it's institutional investors as well. And so to the extent interest rates are stabilizing, moving lower, generally that creates a, a better investing backdrop. Um, to the extent that doesn't happen and the macro environment gets more complicated again, I think that's where 
you know, transaction activity for a firm like Robinhood could suffer, and, and it would be more like the last two years uh, of kind of slower activity. So um, we do think we're kind of pulling out of the trough here, and things are getting better. But that's that's a risk. And then the other side, you know, interest rates moving down. You know, there is some kind of negative effect for them from that dynamic. The good news is, is they pass along the vast majority of the benefit of higher interest rates to the customers. Um, but lo lower interest rates, you know, there is a little bit of an offsetting piece. So you need to see transaction activity more than offset. Uh, you know, the, the, call it the negative impact of, of lower interest rates. All right, Devin, thank you so much for joining us today. That was really helpful. Yeah, great All to see you guys. All things Coinbase. Thank you, Thank sir. you. We move on. Microsoft and OpenAI identifying groups using artificial intelligence in conjunction with their hacking efforts. For more on how the tech giant is navigating cyber threats in the era of AI, let's get to our very own Dan Howley. Dan. That's right. Uh, Microsoft OpenAI basically saying that there are uh, groups that are using different forms of large language models and AI, even ChatGPT, to help them kind of hack into uh, enemy nations, that, nations that they see as enemies, as well as other groups, NGOs, organizations, Microsoft probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, some of the, the ways in which they're doing this is uh, by using these chatbots, uh, again, ChatGPT being one of them, to look up things like satellite capabilities, uh, radar technologies, uh, reconnaissance information, uh, ways of uh, scripting tasks, uh, improving social engineering for phishing and spear phishing emails. Uh, and as you can see here, we have uh, China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. Those are the countries that were uh, named in this report, and they have different groups with fun little names like uh, Charcoal Typhoon and Salmon yeah. Typhoon, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think one is Emerald Sheet, that's out of North Korea, so uh, the names sound really cool, but I think, I think it's interesting to point out that, you know, we constantly talk about how AI is going to help when it comes to things uh, like business practices or, or even some, you know, consumer applications, but Anytime there's new technology, hackers are obviously going to look at it as well. And so that's what's happening here. And regardless of how much uh, we see an advance in technology uh, in the positive for you know, companies that are defending themselves, cybersecurity specialists, the attackers are always going to be one step ahead. That's yeah. just the nature of this game. And so uh, it's the same way here. There's potential that maybe AI can help level that playing field a little bit, but in all likelihood, hackers are going to figure out a way to get around that and continue to stay ahead. Yeah, so that's one of the negatives of AI. And this headline caught my attention too. SEC Gary Gensler was saying that investors should be aware of AI washing because we've seen a lot of uh, activity in those stocks that even mention AI mm -hmm. on their earnings calls. I wanted to get your take on that because I know you cover the space closely. Obviously, AI seems to be the, the buzzword right mm -hmm. now. What do you make of the SEC now saying, look, got to be careful? I mean, look, it's... it's it, it's real, right? Like, I mean, you know, you could talk to, I mean, I got COVID, so I couldn't go to CES, but uh, uh, our own Akiko Fujita did, and she was saying that everything there was basically AI, right? It's, you know, it's uh, the gluten-free now <laughs> yeah. of, uh, of the tech world where you would just slap it on. I don't know what vodka has gluten in it, but apparently Tito's has to tell you that it's gluten-free. And so, r regardless, it's the same idea, right? You're slapping a name on something so that people go, oh, that's that's got AI in it, I might as well right. jump on board. And so you're going to see companies do that. We saw that with the metaverse, yeah. so with NFTs, any company that even thinks about dabbling into it is going to call that out. And, you know, I mean, obviously the metaverse is somewhere at yeah. this point. I just did a piece on how Epic is basically eating uh, Meta's lunch when it comes to getting the metaverse going. But NFTs, that's yeah. really not around, is it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, obviously AI has far more practical implications than a uh, script saying that I own a digital version of a cat eating a hot dog mm -hmm. uh, that you can also copy and gives me absolutely nothing but empties my bank account. But uh, I do think that it's, it's going to be one of those things where you continue to see AI just labeled on, on anything to get attention. Yeah. The AI bubble not bursting anytime mm -hmm. soon. So yeah, Finance is Dan Halley. Thank you so much for those insights. And coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get analyst insights to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned to more Gap Finance after this.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal, to help cut through that noise, to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. And today, we're going to be looking at two e-commerce stocks that are heavily influenced by consumer discretionary spending. As China looks to take market share and pandemic supply chains begin to normalize, what's the best way to play it? Now, I'm here with Yagal Arunian, City Internet Analyst. So, Yagal, thank you for joining us, sir, today. We're going to start off with your first buy here, Yagal. Get this chart moving. Let's see. Here we go. All right, wait for your gall. I'm going to run through the reasons you say, Yagal, this one is a buy for viewers who are playing along at home. Let's go through the first reason, market dominance. Explain that one to us, Yagal. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. This is a really fragmented uh, market. So there is no real fully dominant player, but Wayfair is the leader um, for, for pure, pure play online for sure. Mm. Um, and if um, in, in terms of dominance, what, what they have been doing right is taking share. right? And so this is a market that's been really challenged over the past couple of years. We're still seeing pressure on the consumer and how they're spending. Uh, we're not seeing a rebound in the, in the home goods category just yet. Uh, but Wayfair has been taking share over the past couple of quarters, so they have been outperforming their competitors, and that's one of the reasons that we like it right now. All right, market dominance is your first reason. Let's get to the second one. Margin expansion, you say, you got this, this could be actually material looking ahead. Yeah, uh, so we're really early in the margin expansion story here. Uh, Wayfair invested a lot over, over the COVID period, as you know, a lot of other companies did and made sense given the, the strong growth that they had in terms of sales when everybody was locked at home and buying mm -hmm. furniture for the home office and the backyard and everything. That, all of that slowed. Um, and so they've had to right size. They've, they've been through an, a number of, of layoffs and, and cost right sizing. And we're now at an inflection point where they've started to generate cash over the past couple of quarters. So they're free cash flow positive. Uh, they are EBITDA positive. Um, they've been coming in, in ahead of schedule uh, over the last couple of quarters on this. So they've been executing well mm -hmm. on the cost cuts. Um, and, and we're still very early. The EBITDA margin right now is mid single digits, low to mid single digits. Um, they, in the most recent round of layoffs, which you know, was unfortunate but was necessary, uh, the management talked about getting to $600 million of EBITDA, mm -hmm. potentially even in a flat revenue scenario in 2024. So if the market doesn't rebound, they're still talking about $600 million of EBITDA. That would represent about 5% EBITDA margin. They've talked about getting to 10%, that's their near-term target, no specific timeline on it, but, but near-term. And then they had an investor day last year where they, they painted a, a longer-term picture where they can get to actually get to the high teens. So if, if they continue to execute, um, you know, they'll, they'll need some support from the market and consumers will need to come, come in. But if they continue to execute, we're still very early on this trajectory and you could see material margin expansion over, over the next couple of years. And the final one, you go, the final bullet point here, growth potential, walk us through that. Yeah, so um, you know, like we said, they're, they they are taking share from their competitors, so so that that's been really important. Um, and this is a segment that is seeing um, movement online, right? So so this category is still below average in terms of e-commerce penetration. So they're they're, they're boosted by that. Um, you know, their 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 brand really resonates. They they are kind of um, they have multiple brands, right? They have their where they punch the most is is in the middle tier, and they have a lot of products at value, uh, but they also have a, a, a above as well. So like on, on higher tier products, and they have higher tier brands, and they talk about B two B as a, as a potential opportunity. So they're still really early. Um, e commerce uh, shift benefits them, and then they've got areas where they're still underpenetrated. Got it. And I'm guessing you, you, you like this name, so valuation. You you must still think is attractive at these levels too, right? Yeah, we think the the, the valuation is a, a little bit trickier just because they are early on on the profitability front. But if they are making the, the progress that, that we expect to see here on the margins, yeah. uh, the, the, the EBITDA valuation looks pretty attractive. All so right. they're in the low teens and they could really run from there. So finally, viewers at home, they're convinced you got, you, you got them, they're ready to commit capital. Before they do, what are some risks they need to know about? Yeah, so you know, Wayfair is a really interesting one because it's not the cleanest story right now, right? Um, uh, on, on the macro front in particular, that's probably the biggest near-term challenge that uh, we do enter into a recession. You know, that hasn't happened yet. The consumer does get softer um, and, and the category remains under pressure. Um, that's probably the biggest near-term near one. Um, over the last week or two, we've heard about 
potential Trump tariffs on, right. on inbound China goods. That could, that could have a, a potential impact. Um, we haven't heard anything specifically on um, the Red Sea uh, drama. That can potentially impact some, some of the cost of goods coming in from, from China as well. So that, that's a potential risk. Um, th those are the main ones. And then, and then the, the last one I just mentioned is, they again, they're, they, they need to make progress here on the profitability front. They do have a good amount of debt coming due over the next couple of years, mostly in convertible notes. Um, and they need to really get that on the free cash flow side and generate enough cash so they, they could address that debt. All right, so Wayfair is the one you like, you got. Let's go to one you don't like. One is, and this one's interesting. This is Etsy. Let's go through these reasons right here. The first reason you would say Etsy is one to avoid low volume growth. Yeah, so for, for Etsy, I'd first start off by just saying they have an incredible management team, and we might get to that on the risks to this call. Um, and and they, they've done a great job, and they, they were super successful dur uh, during the early part of COVID. They, they saw uh, triple-digit uh, top-line growth and, and volume growth. Uh, they, they saw their buyers double, uh, and, and they've hung on to, to the majority of those gains. So, the, so Etsy did a great job. The challenge is, it, over the last year or so, they've kind of run out of steam, and, and they haven't been able to, to recapture uh, that, that growth profile again. And it's a little hard to see in the near term. Um, you know, they are fully exposed to consumer discretionary. That's exactly where they live. In the near term, it's hard to see them uh, move past that. Uh, and then that, that was actually your second point, too exposed to discretionary spending for, for your likes? Yeah, I mean, 100% of the volume on their platform is, is consumer discretionary, and we talked that, about that with Wayfair too. But there are some different dynamics. And so those headwinds are, are, are really challenged. The, where we're seeing the, the biggest uh, impact on spending right now is on consumer discretionary goods. Right? You've seen a shift uh, on spend from goods to services. That hasn't really gone away. We're seeing with you know, prices ri rising on, on essentials and non-discretionary items, that's where consumers are focusing their spend. And where, uh, unfortunately for Etsy, where, where that is getting hit the most is on consumer discretionary spend and, on goods. And you got quickly here, competition, that's your third reason, how come? Uh, so we get asked about the rise of Timu in particular and Shein uh, more than anything, I think, in mm -hmm. e-commerce uh, from, from, our, from our clients. Um, and Etsy actually called out the competition from Timu last quarter. Um, it's having an impact on them. There's a couple of things going on. One is a dollar spent on Timu is a dollar less spent on Etsy, and their management team talked about seeing some of that impact. And then the other factor is Timu was spending a ton of money on advertising. If you watch the Super Bowl, you sure saw, you saw yeah, three, multiple three, three ads. Timu ads. Yeah. They're spending a lot on, on performance marketing, and you know Etsy drives traffic and sales through performance marketing. That's, that's lifting the prices of performance marketing, which is making it harder to drive profitable ROI, and Etsy's had to shift some of their spend from performance into other channels. The, the challenge is the ROI, um, the, the payback period on that is a little bit longer, so it takes longer to, to capture the value from a TV budget than a Google budget. Got it, let's end here. How could you be wrong, Egal? Where we could be wrong is I'd go back to, to this management team who is excellent. Um, uh, Josh and Rachel started both in 2018 around the same time. They completely turned around this company. Um, so they are being run by a really trustworthy set of hands, and I think there is a lot of value in that. So you, know, you can kind of trust them to try to right-size the ship. And again, in the near term, I think the headwinds are, are, are a little bit too big. We could see the consumer rebound um, a little bit faster than expected, and that, that would help boost some of the strategy. If they do a good, good job addressing the new competitive landscape, um, that, that can be another thing that, that brings more growth back. All right, let's, let's sum this one up for, for viewers here. So you're telling you all investors buy Wayfair, uh, given its current market dominance, its potential for growth. On the other side, you're saying right here, you would avoid Etsy as it is too reliant on discretionary consumer spending and facing competition coming from China. Thank you so much for joining us, you and thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll bring you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. More Yahoo Finance right after this.
Lyft shares climbing today after a roller coaster 24 hours for that stock. Lyft shares rocketing up nearly 70% in the after hours trading yesterday after an error on a key profitability metric in Lyft's fourth quarter earnings report. But listen, a strong earnings report there, including progress made toward profitability, seems to have offset any worries over that error. And joining me now to talk about all this is Lyft CEO David Risher. David, it is always great to have you on the show. I got a lot to talk about, David. I want to get to the, the earnings report. I got questions about Taylor Swift and Beyonce. We need to get to that. But first, David, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about, listen, this error, um, this typo that occurred, David. Can you walk us through kind of what happened? Can you pinpoint why it happened and, and how are you going to make sure that it, that it doesn't happen again? Yeah, hey, Josh, it's good to see you. Um, listen, it was, a, it was an error. Uh, it was a clerical error. And as I've said before, this is on me. Uh, the buck stops with me. There are a lot of eyes that go on these sorts of press releases before they go out. Um, somehow, uh, all of our eyes got a little bit cloudy and didn't see this one um, extra zero creep in. But I'd say the good news is as soon as we found it, we were able to issue a correction very quickly. Obviously, all this happened um, after market hours. And then actually, first thing this morning, the team got together and did a preliminary postmortem. We're doing another one this afternoon on how it happened and how it's never going to happen again. So. Uh, it, you know, it's it's an error, um, you know, frankly, embarrassing. Um, never want to see this happen, but uh, I'm thrilled about how fast the team has gotten on uh, fixing it and making sure it didn't happen again. And David, you know, one more question on this. You know, when you saw, you know, we broke that print on air and you saw this move, I mean, money was, you know, listen, David, it was made and lost on that typo. You wouldn't be surprised, you know, if regulators were looking at this, if lawsuits could start flying. For investors listening to this right now, David, how, how should they think about those possible risks? Um, you know, it's hard for me to comment on this. I, I don't think it's material, but that's not my, I, I'm not talking about the typo, but I'm talking about the risk after, but it's really not my area of expertise. All I can say is we're doing, you know, everything we possibly can. And, and you know, mistakes do happen, of course. Press releases get issued the wrong time. These things have happened before. I'm sure there's a precedent. I'm just not an expert in it. All right, David, let, let's turn to what you are an expert in, which is Lyft's uh, business results. Let's go through that print, David. Listen, you reported, and clearly investors like what they see. Can you walk us, David, through what, what drove the quarter? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, what's so exciting is it validates our thesis, which is that customer obsession can drive profitable growth. I mean, look at the numbers. We're talking about, you know, the highest, you know, bookings ever is $13.8 billion in bookings. Um, uh, highest ridership ever over the course of the year, I'm talking about over 40 million uh, riders, 25% of whom were new to the platform, which is fantastic. 700 million rides. And I always like to remind people, every single ride is a thing, right? It's going to, the, to your school, it's going to work, it's going to see your friend, it's going to see your family, it's going to the airport. I, by the way, for the driver, it's an earnings opportunity and we paid out $8 billion in driver earnings last year. So if you just look, it's kind of check, 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 check and check in terms of taking that customer obsession and, and dropping money you know, to the bottom line. We were free cash flow positive last year and we project that we'll be uh, all through 2024. Yeah, and that was a big metric that got a lot of attention, David. So I want to go into that. You are guiding to be free cash flow positive this this year. How are That's you right. doing that, David? What levers are you pulling over there at Lyft? Yeah, again, a lot of it is customer obsession. You know, Lyft is a it's a scale business, and by that I mean we have a certain fixed cost base, and we've been very disciplined about managing that. You might remember shortly after I joined that we cut costs, which is very painful because that means headcount. But it sets us at a position where we can start to make money as we drive more volume across the platform. So the more the more drivers we get, by the way, the faster ETAs, that's pickup time, uh, the shorter the wait, therefore the more riders take what uh, you know take a lift ride, the more riders who take a lift ride, that's more money into the system. And as we grow that volume from 700 million rides to 750 million rides to 800 million rides, um, that's how we start making money. And, and, and David, another thing that got my attention, Taylor Swift and Beyonce, David, you actually called this out. Yeah. And the idea yeah. was, you know, there's a lot of people, they're going to these stadiums, they're catching these shows, these concerts, and, and yeah. we know they're taking Lyft to get there. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting, Josh. I mean, look, I think in a sense, like the big thing here, it's even bigger than what you're, bigger than Taylor Swift. And now we're talking big. It's almost the physical world fights back, right? For every you know, new digital device, for every new app on the phone, for every new, you know, uh, goggle or whatever that shows up, you know, there's just as much of a longing, if not more so, for going out and having real world experiences. So if you look at stadiums year on year, we're up 37%, just trips to stadiums. And then when you when you zoom in, and now, now we'll talk directly about, about Taylor, 
it's incredible. In Nashville, our rides were up 25%, right, when she comes to town. If you look in Cincinnati, uh, rides to the hotel, because a lot of people are visiting from out of town, were up 60%. And then here's a crazy stat that blows my mind. I think it actually speaks very highly of Taylor Swift fans. They tend to tip three times higher than average. So there's this whole ecosystem that goes along with travel in general, events in specific, and then Taylor is, is kind of her own thing. All right, so Taylor Swift fans, that's some insight. They're more generous, perhaps, than some may think. They're incredible. Let me ask you this, though. On the other side of it, David, you know, mm -hmm. um, would you be concerned about slower growth if there weren't, let's say, in the quarters ahead, as many concerts from these kind of superstars? You know, I'm not, and here's why. It's not just concerts. It's not just NFL games. It's not, you know, it's the Seattle Storm in Seattle, a great WNBA franchise. It's the Kraken also in Seattle. It's the Thorn in um, in uh, Portland. We do something interesting here in San Francisco. We haven't talked yet about publicly, so we won't talk about that today. But so between sporting events, uh, you know, concert events, and then just frankly, humans desire to get out and about. I mean, that's a real thing. And this is what Jeff Bezos always used to tell me. He said, don't make bets on short-term things, make bets on long-term things. And we're social. And so you can see everything from back to the office, some of it voluntary, some of it involuntary, but still, you know, concerts, travel, and all the rest. Over the long term, these things will only grow. And David, another issue I want to get your, your take on drivers for Lyft and Uber uh, expected to strike today, issues over uh, pay and treatment. What's your message to those drivers, David? So uh, my message is, you know, we're obsessing over you just like we're obsessing over riders. And here's the evidence. Last week, we put out a new driver earnings release. It was our early 2024 release and it had three components, super fast. The first one's transparency. Every single week you see how much riders paid and how much you're taking home. Super important to drivers. Number two, a guarantee. That take rate for a driver will never be less than 70% after external fees. And I mean never, we will, we will, we will uh, true you up at the end of the week if it's less. And then the third is quicker deactivation appeals, which is sort of technical, but it involves how a driver can effectively appeal the fact that we may have temporarily um, taken them off the platform. By the way, 77% of deactivations are now reactivated within 24 hours. So we're making really strong moves on all the areas that drivers tell me, and they're very vocal about their needs, um, but our view is driving is a great, great way to earn money, and we want to make it uh, fantastic for drivers. We really do. David, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. As always, very much appreciate your time and insight. Of course. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves, the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's get a quick check of the markets. And Ali, we are ending the day in the green following that sharp sell-off yesterday. We got that hotter CPI print, but I'm looking here. I just see green across all the major averages. The Dow's up about four tenths of a percent. The S&P 500, your broad gauge is up about one percent. And the tech-heavy Nasdaq, remember that got hit yesterday. Read different story today. It's going to finish up here about one point three percent. And maybe some of the good feelings here of why buyers perhaps feel like it could step in. We did get some positive Fed speak today. We got Fed Bank of Chicago President Austin Goolsby. He's saying, listen, about that hot CPI print, in his opinion, let's not make too much of it, maybe. Maybe one higher than expected CPI print is not a trend make. Investors were paying attention. They bid up stocks. Investors breathing a little easier today. Stocks edging higher just a day after that major sell-off. Jared Blickery is going to take us here through a look at today's action. Jared. Yes, Josh, we're seeing a reprieve today in the bond market and the dollar, and stocks are shooting higher. Specifically, the uh, Russell 2000, the small caps, up over 2% after a 4% drubbing yesterday. So still in the red on a two-day basis, but clawing back those losses. Looking at the leaderboard today, industrials, a rare leadership position, up 1.65%. Following that, you have the three mega cap sectors, communication services, tech, and consumer discretionary. Only Staples and Energy fit, finishing the day in the red. And let's take a look at the Dow here, since industrials are leading. Uh, we can see, where is it? Caterpillar up 1.25%. The real leader here, not an industrial, we're seeing Salesforce up almost 3% and Intel up over 2%. And speaking of chip stocks, it was another really strong showing here. NVIDIA up 2.5%, another record high. Uh, we've been seeing a little bit of a difference between chips and software, but pretty much green all around the board. Shopify up 4.5%. And if we take a look at our leaderboard today, we're going to see a couple of interesting things. Disruption, ARC is up 5.5%. And then we got the crypto trade. I was looking at that in the last hour. So let's just shift over to disruption here, where we see uh, ARK Innovation Holdings Coinbase, that's up 14%. That says Bitcoin uh, surges north of 50,000. We also have some other big movers here. Uh, Path is up 4%. Roblox up 4%. Robinhood after earnings, that is up 13%. And the list goes on here. Um, and then just thinking about the bond market and how we close the day, I did mention we had a bit of a reprieve. And and even in volatility, we are seeing markets come off of their highs. This is a look at the Siebel Volatility Index, the VIX. That was almost at a 16 yesterday, and it is now back down to a 14 handle. Thanks, Jared. Always good to see that VIX low and those stocks high. And speaking of higher stocks, we're joined now by Cole Smead, Smead Capital Management CEO and Portfolio Manager. Thank you so much for joining us. So, you know, great news. We finally closed in the green after that major sell-off yesterday. Given that, do you think the market reaction to those hotter-than-expected CPI numbers was a bit overblown? And could it possibly be a good thing that now it seems like the Fed and markets are at least on the same page when it comes to those potential rate cuts? down the line. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, to your point, the market's been uh, wrong-footed for quite a long time on this idea that the Fed is going to lower rates uh, in a hastened fashion and have to do that because of the economy. I think the real shocker to people is, one, the economy is incredibly strong and continues to chug along. Um, you know, you can see that in the job numbers. The second thing is the CPI is staying stickier than people would have expected. And, you know, we started this year with people coming into the year saying, great, we're going to be lowering rates in March. Now the Fed futures are in July. If they don't end up moving till October, uh, I think there's a lot of people that are gonna be sitting there thinking, why was I taking so much risk when I could have collected over 5% in short-term rates? And I, I think that's really the picture to cast here is do stocks make sense based on how much you can get paid short-term in the fixed income uh, money markets? And in many respects, the answer is no. And, and Cole, so I'm interested to get your take. You know, wh when do you think the Fed does start cutting? By how much? And how does that kind of impact and influence your investment strategy, Cole? It's, it's, it's a it's a good question to ask, um, Josh. So, so let me so let, think about it like this: If we're going to end up at the end of the day at three percent, then all the equity people should be feeling really good about stocks because ultimately we're going to go to a lower level of the short-term cost of capital. Okay. If we're ending up you know, somewhere north of 400 basis points, that's still very tight monetary policy compared to what most people invested over the last 15 years. And I think that's really the way to think about it. Um, we always talk about recency bias. We always talk about anchoring bias, You know, kind of like the things that Daniel Kahneman wrote about. 
And yet here we sit where people want to go back to what they're used to, where they have muscle memory. And the reality of the situation looks to be that the Fed will be tight for a much longer and, and higher levels than people would have anticipated. That does not bode well for most assets now. If you're the bond market, you've already dealt with that to a certain respect. If you're real estate, you're dealing with that. Stocks are really the last person to find Jesus. So Cole, given that, do you think that we could potentially see a no landing scenario where we don't reach that 2% inflation rate? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think about it, the nominal level of inflation because again, inflation can be a pretty tricky argument. If you go back and look at the 1970s, we had a pickup of inflation into the late 1960s, uh, and then it came off its high, and the roller coaster took it back higher from 72 to 74. So the idea that just because inflation came to a lower level that it's bad, that's where the market's really false. That's where a lot of people betting on the Fed futures are really wrong, in our opinion, is that, oh, it's lower, therefore it's gone. No, let me just point out uh, a couple examples. Baby boomers left the workforce after the pandemic. They're gone. They'll never come back. That's a structural problem. Secondly, government largesse, it's still present. We're going to add 1% to GDP just in Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security next year. That is a structural problem. Lastly, the problems we see outside the United States are structural problems. We're going to deal with higher costs because of wars, unlike my childhood, might I add. So that has not changed. That will not change. So the idea that inflation is bagged off of effectively policy tools, the problem with that is the Fed said the same thing in 04. Uh, Reality was their best chance was good luck back then. We had an economic calamity four years later, even though they said our policy tools are so much better. My point is, is that it, just because the Fed feels good about their policy tools doesn't mean inflation is bad. It might have just been good luck. That's it in the interim. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this, because you say it's time to, quote, buy the dogs, oil and banks. Those are two interest rate sensitive areas of the market. Why do you think now in particular is a good time to get into those sectors? Yeah, uh, you're just paying far less multiples to get the returns on capital uh, that, that you'd get otherwise. So, for example, someone might say, but Cole, there's asset light businesses out there that produce higher returns on capital than those businesses. Yeah, but you have to pay far higher book multiples. Um, you know, for example, going out and paying 40 times revenues. Um, to use Scott McNeely's quote from O2, that's like assuming over the next 40 years, I don't have to pay any expenses and I don't have to pay the government at all, which is illegal, by the way. The problem with that is it just doesn't work, historically speaking, okay? Versus I can go out and find a bank today that produces higher than a 10% return on equity and pay below book for that. That's a pretty good way to make money in, in you know, historical stock returns in banking, in oil, the same thing. You can get better returns than many other businesses, and you don't pay the same multiples. Um, are they liked or loved industries? No. Banking just had a big problem last year. People have ran away. Oil stocks didn't have such a good 23. The disappointment is really, in my opinion, not only what protects you, but was what it's like to make you a lot more money looking forward. What about small caps, Cole? The Russell 2000 had its worst day since June 2022 yesterday, but a lot of strategists are bullish on small caps in the long run. What's your take? Yeah, I don't think there's really like a small cap. Uh, you know, if someone says, you know, you know, they put a gun to my head and say Russell 2 versus the S&P, I think the Russell 2 will do better. It's not because small caps look so incredible. It's because big cap tech looks so stupid. And Russell 2 owns none of that. Cole, thank you as always for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Let's get to Cisco shares. They are sinking here after the company reports second quarter earnings. Let's get to those numbers, Ali. So on the bottom, adjusted EPS 87 cents. That's verse 84. That's a beat. Revenue, the top line, 12.79 billion. She was closer to 12.71 billion. So that's a beat. Adjusted gross margins clock in at 66.7 percent. That was better than expected. I think the issue here, though, is clearly the guide. So mm -hmm. for the Q3 revenue, they're looking for 12.1 to 12.3 billion. Street was close to 13.1 billion. And for the year, they say they are now seeing 51.5 to 52.5 billion. Before, they had been seeing more like 53.8 to 55 billion. So they do cut that outlook, that forecast. And they are also going to cut, it looks like we have layoffs here, cut about 5% of the global workforce here, Ellie. Yeah, and those layoffs were expected to yep. be announced. The company is working to streamline costs, prioritize profitability, and really pivot the overall strategy of their business. They're looking to uh, make more of a clear shift into services and software. They have that pending acquisition of Splunk, which demonstrates part of that shift. And even Splunk has been laying off workers in preparation of that merger. But, you know, coming into this print, there were 
low expectations, right? We've seen this sales slow down, this pile up of inventory. Cisco, one of those companies that just still impacted by the pandemic. And with the reaction in shares right now, investors want to see more. They want to see improvements. And interesting that you brought up the guidance, too, because I feel like that's been a big thing driving a lot of these stock prices after hours. Yeah, it's interesting. Just a few more headlines about these cuts to the workforce. 5% of Cisco's workforce would mean about 4,000 jobs. Mm. Um, it is interesting here. Listen, you know, Cisco is still seen as very much, you know, it's a kind of tech bellwether, right? It, it did make its name in hardware with routers and switches, but under CEO Chuck Robbins, they pivot, pivoted to software and services. But people will look to Cisco here to kind of pull out from the conference call, was it say more broadly, not just about Cisco, but just overall enterprise tech spend. Yeah, and again, their shares are down more than 5%. Still to come on Yahoo Finance, earnings season is in full swing. After the break, we'll dive into the latest numbers from Twilio, TripAdvisor, and Occidental Petroleum. Stay tuned, more Yahoo Finance on the other side. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Tesla in focus today after big money institutional investors appear to be turning bearish, with some believing the stock will underperform over the next six months. That's the takeaway from an informal poll by Morgan Stanley. Important to note that analyst Adam Jonas does not agree with the sentiment remaining overweight on shares, but he does see some roadblocks ahead. Yahoo Finance's autos reporter, Pras Romanian, is here with more. And Pras, Adam Jonas, typically a big Tesla bull. What are the concerns here? Well, they held these institutional lunches, right, with their big, big shareholders every now and then. In this case, it's Tesla shareholders. And it turns out that the big headline here is, like you mentioned there, 
mo all of them at the luncheon said that Tesla will underperform in the next six months, and almost all of them said over the next 12 months. So they're kind of concerned that, you know, these guys own a lot of shares, but they're concerned that the, the actual share itself will kind of stay where it's at through the next year. Um, why is that? So there's a few kind of concerns here. Number one, you know, obviously, Musk sidelining AI growth, you know, with, with his tweets about wanting to control the company, otherwise he wants to take AI out of Tesla. That's sort of a big driver for potential future earnings for the company down the line. Also, volume growth, there's concern that Tesla may not grow their volumes if, if, and potentially even have negative growth with volumes. And in just this past quarter, they had about 35% uh, growth over year over year. So the concern is that we're going to have some issues with not just the AI stuff, but also the fact that the company may not grow as much too. Yeah. And this is all coming for us too, as we hear about, uh, they're upping some pricing on some Tesla vehicles, right? Yeah, for the Model 3, the new upgraded Model 3, going to see a price hike here of $1,500, which is actually you know, kind of surprising even the fact that we've seen so many price cuts in the past, uh, notably starting in January. But this is a new model. There might be more demand for it. It's better suspension, better interior components, just a better car overall. So I'm not surprised it might be seeing some lift here, but there, you're noting that right here, that right now with that price hike, it's going to be the same price as the RWD Model Y, which is very interesting because that's their, their big volume mover. So interesting to see that the Model 3, which is historically been much cheaper than the Model Y, now almost reaching that uh, price parity there. Hi, Prazo, Tesla, always one of those names that we love to track. Thank you so <laughs> much for breaking it down for us. Well, it was once dubbed the next gold rush and prices soared, but post-pandemic lithium mining has had a hard run. The mineral, which is used in most EV batteries as well as smartphones, was priced at nearly $90 a tone in 2022 and now comes in at just over $13. But is the pain now priced in? Piedmont Lithium managed to be profitable in Q3 despite the headwinds and will be reporting earnings this month. Its CEO, Keith Phillips, joins us now along with our senior reporter, Inez Ferre. Keith, thank Thank you so much. As we just alluded to, the pricing here has been very volatile. In order to compensate for that, your company has had to go through some restructuring, committing to a $10 million cost-cutting plan that will slash 27% of your workforce. How do you think that restructuring plan will re really uh, insulate your business from some of these downward pricing pressures that we're seeing? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be back with you guys again. Um, yeah, the restructuring was difficult. Uh, we had to do something similar a few years back when when we were a smaller company. Uh, great people, the people departing are all terrific and we wish we wish them the best, but we really just wanna make sure we get our cash uh, outflow and our cost position kind of in check for the current market. So I've been in this business seven years. I joined in a bull market, I suffered through the bear market in 2020, 2021 went through a really strong bear, uh, bull market over the last couple of years, and now we're in another bear market. It's a cyclical business. We're gonna have our ups and downs, the whole industry will. I think the good news is in the mining speak, uh, low prices are the cure for low prices. So with the prices being down now 90% from the peak 15, 16 months ago, uh, just about every new development project is slowing down or being just pushed to the right by a year or more. And it just means we're going to have another supply crunch. Uh, it's a matter of time, in my view, and prices will rebound. I think and go to go to very high levels. So we need to be sure we're ready for that and prepared for that. And uh, and that's why we went through what we did. Keith, so what do you see happening in the meantime? Because there is a supply that's expected to grow this year. For how long? I mean, how long do you think that it will take for the market to absorb all this? Uh, I don't think it'll take long. I mean, I think the market, you know, customers are at record lows in their inventory levels. Um, and I think, you know, Chinese New Year's ending sort of as we speak, and I, we're hoping for a, a pretty rapid bounce back. I'm not, we're not budgeting for that, but it, it, but it could happen. I think demand uh, grew very dramatically last year. Lithium demand was up over 25%. EV demand in January this year was up 69% globally from last January. Very significant change. So I think you know, the demise of the EV industry is 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 greatly exaggerated. Uh, overall, last year, I think demand was up 35% for EVs. So the business is still growing strongly. Uh, there are projects that are coming online this year. There aren't that many really in the overall scheme of things. More importantly, as you look out to 2025 and six and seven, we know all the project, the pipeline very, very, very well. Very little that is gonna get developed or funded in this environment. Even if you have a project ready to develop, which not many people do, you're going to slow it down because financing is more expensive, debt's more expensive, equity is a lot more expensive for companies like Piedmont. So you're just going to be more patient and you're going to wait for a stronger environment. And that's what's going to happen. We've seen Albemarle announce deferrals of their project in South Carolina. 
Uh, our projects in the U.S. are clearly going to move more slowly. These are a billion dollar projects. They're really important strategically for us and for the country. Um, but now's not the right time to fund them. So those delays just mean there will be a lot less supply for the car companies and battery companies who so desperately need it. So I think the recovery is a matter of time. Um, the strong companies will kind of get through this and be ready. And and I really think, you know, we went from euphoria two years ago to despair today. Someone described it today as peak pessimism. Uh, I think we'll be in a euphoric mindset again at some point not too far in the future. And how do you see this shaking out with the projects, as you as you mentioned, these projects that are slowing down? Uh, do you see consolidation with some of these projects, with some of these companies that have been that have announced plans? Yeah, you know, there's there's I guess three kinds of companies in the industry. There are the established handful of companies. It's literally that's all there are in you know Albemarle Live, you know Arcadium. There now are a couple others, a couple of the Chinese. Uh, they're established. They have project pipelines. Some of their projects will advance. Others will be deferred, I'm sure. Uh, there are companies like us that are early stage producers. So we have the only producing spongemy mine in North America. Uh, it's called North American Lithium with our partner, Sayana, uh, Sayana Mining out of Australia. Uh, great project. Again, the only producing spongemy mine in North America. It's the biggest lithium operation in all of North America. It's operating. So that's great. So we want to operate that through this cycle and be ready for when the market rebounds because we, we're pretty sure it will. Uh, and then there are dozens and dozens, literally hundreds of earlier stage lithium companies who have some interesting, pro some have interesting projects, others maybe less less interesting. All of those are going to move more slowly. Uh, it's going to be harder for them to raise the equity capital. Those companies are where we were five or six years ago, where you don't have any revenue, you're really funding your operations or your development out of, out of equity offerings, which are tougher when the stocks are down 50% or more. So I think that it'll all move more slowly. Um, and I think it's just this is an industry that's probably in the third inning of its development. I mean, the, the industry is probably quadrupled in the seven years I've been in the business. Uh, it's going to quadruple again from here over the next seven to 10 years. And at some point, it'll be mature. I think that's really in the 2040s. For the time being, I think we're unfortunately going to go through these volatile times. The good news is, if you just look at the stock price graphs and the lithium price graphs down 90 percent, uh, it's a pretty interesting time to take take a position, I think, and build for the longer term. Keith Phillips, appreciate your insight. And as always, thanks to our Inez Frey. And thanks so much. Taking a look at Twilio as its fourth quarter results hit the wire alley. So Twilio reports and investors not happy, or at least initially in the, in the after hours. Let's talk Q4 first, uh, because that looks actually good relative to consensus. Uh, adjusted EPS 86 cents versus 56, so that's a beat. Revenue 1.8 billion versus the 104 that analysts had modeled. So beats on, on the on the bot, bottom and top. I think like Cisco though, uh, which we just broke, I think there are issues with, with the forecast. Q1 revenue, they're calling for 103 to 104, and the street was closer to 105, so, mm -hmm. so that's a miss. Yeah, this has been another company just dealing with deceleration in sales growth. The expectation, though, is that the fourth quarter would be the bottom of this trend. So I, I do agree with you that the guidance there is a bit disappointing. HSBC recently downgraded the stock to reduce from hold, citing it has a, quote, low growth profile. So it's really just one of those names where the story is going to have to continue to improve for investors moving forward. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those pandemic stories. Such yeah. strong growth and demand during the pandemic, but then you kind of saw that slow post-pandemic and we can further in 2023. There's been some big changes in this company C-suite. You saw CEO Jeff Lawson, um, he did step down. I don't think that surprised a lot of people given some of the struggles mm -hmm. the company was having. And then another exec, uh, Kozema Shiplander, stepped in, take the reins. So we'll see where we go from here. But at least initially, uh, investors aren't happy and this stock was already down about 7% this year heading into the print. Yeah, never good. Well, coming up, we're taking a deep dive into Elon Musk's social media platform X and how his leadership or lack thereof has impacted the company. Stay tuned, more Yahoo Finance after this.
Less than two years ago, Elon Musk closed his takeover of Twitter. Cut to present day, the app has been renamed X. The company's headcount has plummeted alongside ad sales. Musk stepped back as CEO, but his conduct remains a headache for new leadership. In her new book, Extremely Hardcore, Inside Elon Musk's Twitter, author Zoe Schiffer offers inside details of Musk's tumultuous tenure at the social media platform. Zoe, it is great to have you on the show. You know, Zoe, we got, we got a few books now on Elon Musk Twitter, we got, got your book. Uh, there's Kurt Wagner. There, there's Ben Mesrich, I think. So th this is this is a topic getting a lot of attention. Why, Zoe, did you decide though? Kind of walk us through this work. Why did you decide, Zoe? This was really you know this was a subject you wanted to tackle, report, and write a book on. Yeah. Zoe, so you might be muted I, there. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I was muted for a second. The The main reason was just that I had spent a year reporting on all of the ins and outs of what had happened in the acquisition and beating out some of the bigger publications to get those stories first. And while I knew that I was going to be competing with many big name authors on this topic, I wanted to tell a very specific story, which is what it was like being there in the room with Elon Musk as one of the employees as this was all going on. And so I told the story through the accounts of these four individuals who all had very different experiences, but worked very closely with Elon Musk for the 12 months after he bought the company. And Zoe, as you've just been mentioning, you've been following Musk's career for a very long time. He's certainly a controversial figure, but he does also have this cult-like following. So why do you think Musk is such an intriguing f figure out there? I mean, I think it's been very well documented that there's a mutually beneficial relationship between his fans and him. A lot of his fans are also his stockholders. There's a reason that Tesla is like the number one um, app on Robin Hood that people buy um, that retail stock in. And, you know, he really indulges that community. And in return, they really fight for him. And it's been a situation where as he's gotten more and more controversial, as he's kind of slid and become a little more right wing, overtly right wing, his audience, it's like he's made of Teflon. Everything kind of slides off of him because he continues to be enormously successful financially and his fans benefit from that. Zori, I'm interested, you know, obviously you spent a lot of time thinking about this company, you know, where it was, where it is, and, and where it's headed. I'm interested, Zoe, how you think maybe the business model could shift going ahead. I asked because, listen, we all we all saw Musk at DealBook, and I think at that point he made his, his views on advertisers pretty well known, Zoe. Uh, I'm wondering, in part, do you think he did that because maybe in the future advertising will be less important and somehow, somehow the economics of the business could change, more subscriptions and AI? Yeah, you're spot on. He's had a goal of kind of divesting Twitter, now called X, from advertisers from day one. He said very clearly that he hates advertisers, and the reason for that is very apparent. Advertisers, in one sense, are content moderators. They want a stable platform where their ad will show up next to a tweet from LeBron James, not a hateful comment or a nude photo or anything like that. And the reality is that Elon Musk doesn't want to have those kinds of constraints on the platform. And so he sees shifting the business model towards subscriptions and artificial intelligence as being a big goal of his. Unfortunately, it's been very difficult for him to do that so far as we've seen with kind of the plummeting sales of Twitter Blue. So where then does the future of this business lie? You mentioned AI, but we've seen an influx of bots and spam accounts on X, which also goes against what Musk ultimately wants this company to be. So if you don't have ads, what do you really have to drive this business? Right now, I'm totally speculating, but he's talked a lot about going really hard on payments, making X a payments platform in addition to a social platform. You could imagine how that would generate revenue for the business. I also personally think that his generative AI company, XAI, that has kind of a synergistic relationship with X will be the main focus. And if he's continuing to court investment, the investment dollars, you can imagine, will go to the AI company, which is has all of the momentum in the tech industry right now. And X will kind of be a training ground for the large language models that that company is building, but maybe won't be the source of all of the investment and the resources moving forward. And so I'll get you out of here on this. Just interested to get your take uh, on Linda you know, Yaccarino brought in there, Zoe, given her expertise, her background, her, her contacts on Madison Avenue. What do you make so far of, of the job she's been able to do, Zoe? Do you have any sense that she's been able to make any headway with marketers? 
Yeah, I mean, she's done a pretty masterful job given the situation in continuing to court big name advertisers. She was able to get a bunch of them back for the Super Bowl in particular, but she's up against a very difficult situation. She's able to get those advertisers back for the Super Bowl at the same time during the Super Bowl. What is Elon Musk tweeting about? He's tweeting about boobs. And that's, again, just not a very attractive situation for your average advertiser. So she's continuing to try and get them on board, but she's also having to clean up Elon Musk's messes. Zoe, I'm sorry, Ali, I jumped no, in. I was no. so excited. I jumped right into your listen, spot. Listen, listen, Zoe, I'm sure you're going to have another book to write soon because Elon Musk is not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> Zoe Schiffer, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we're getting some more earnings in. Shares of TripAdvisor higher after the company exceeded fourth quarter earnings expectations on both the top and bottom lines. Taking through some of these numbers here, adjusted earnings coming in at 38 cents a share. The street was expecting 21 cents, so a significant beat there. Revenue also coming in ahead of estimates, 390 million versus the expected 373 million. Adjusted EBITDA also beating in the fourth quarter. And on top of that, TripAdvisor is exploring a potential sale. The company said that it has formed a special committee to evaluate potential offers to buy the company or related transactions. And a lot a lot of analysts on the street are actually bullish about this. We saw TD Cowan recently raise its price target on the stock and keep its market perform rating on the heels of that possible deal news. So perhaps something will come out of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the stock, just remember, it surged yeah. uh, when Reuters first had that. It really pumped up. I mean, so clearly analysts and investors are, are going to be very keen to hear any more on that. You know, are there actually active discussions, mm -hmm. if there are discussions, are there, are there potential acquires, any color and commentary the street can get, that's what they'll be focused on on this call. Yeah, any, any deal, I think, pumps that stock higher, yeah, but we're up, we're up about 5% right now. Coming up, how does the box office keep up with the rapidly changing media landscape? We speak to the CEO of MoviePass on the other side.
The box office experiencing its worst weekend since the pandemic last weekend, competing with Super Bowl 58. This coming against the backdrop of an industry struggling to find success outside of sequels and already existing IP. For more on the movie landscape in 2024, we're talking to MoviePass co-founder and CEO Stacy Spikes. Stacy, thanks so much for joining us. And look, your business relies on people going to the movies. So what do you make of a disappointing weekend like we just saw? And are there any concerns if we can continue to see that underperformance for your business? Yeah, actually, January is always a soft period. I think you're seeing some restocking going on where you had a lot of content move out and it's starting to move back in. But you're seeing titles like Dune, which is coming in March, which is normally someone who's going to sit in the fourth quarter or, say, the, uh, the summer coming out in March. So I think that that's normal, and I, but I don't see any big concern over it. And Stacey, your company, MoviePass, just achieved its first year of profitability, and it wasn't too long ago that you bought this company out of bankruptcy. How were you able to get to that profitability, and what were the lessons learned along the way? Yeah, well, the, the amazing thing about it was, you know, back when the company was sold and went through its issues, we actually had the ability to benefit from a lot of AI and machine learning upgrades that we just didn't have back then. That was a big difference. And then our new credit system that we introduced also really made a big change in the business model and the capability of being able to perform properly. So that's the two major updates that we were able to do that really helped everything. And how can you sustain this profitability, especially when you're in an industry where we're seeing a lot of turmoil, especially with the influx of streaming services? Yeah, you know, maybe we're bullish and long on it, but the reality is we're seeing that the studios who were creating content for the streamers have seen the benefit where you see them repurposing titles. We've had last year a commitment from Apple with more than a billion dollars and Amazon and even Netflix committing to the theatrical experience. So I think you've got a pipeline lag that you're looking at, but all in all, people are coming back. You saw a lot of young people starting to use theaters as concert venues uh, with the Taylor Swift concert and Beyonce. Um, so we're seeing it become more of a live event. You're seeing more IMAX releases. So all in all, I actually feel really positive about it. And I want to pick up on that point with the pipeline lag, because in terms of consumer demand, I'm assuming you see more signups when there's actually a lot of movies in the theater, right? Like this past summer with Barbenheimer. You mentioned the lulls that we've had post-COVID, post-Hollywood strikes. So is there a way that you could attract users to your platform when you perhaps don't have a ton of movies? I know you mentioned some of those examples, but what other ways could you boost that demand? Yeah, for us as a business model, the major tent poles aren't the drivers and people wanting a subscription platform where they're gonna experiment more. We find that they're actually more interested in the independent titles mm. and that's where the experimentation happens. So uh, just, you know, with the Dunes and the Spider-Mans and the IMAX titles, that really wouldn't change our business. It's just not enough of those titles but it's all of the smaller ones like we saw with uh, Origin, we saw with uh, Poor Things, a lot of the ones that are the uh, the Oscar nominees. That's where, uh, you know, 75% of our members are under the age of 35 and they like to experiment. So if you're gonna end up on our platform, there's a lot of inventory sitting there. Yeah, that's interesting, especially since we've seen sequels and that known IP really driving some of the box office there. But in terms of competition, we've seen things like AMC stubs, other types of reward programs. How are you looking to combat those types of, of, of competitors out there and really stay on top of the game? Yeah, great question. So the difference between MoviePass is you can go to literally any theater. So as long as it accepts major credit cards, that theater is open to your system. And with AMC, you can only go to an AMC. So that is a loyalty program just for them. But on average in our system, the average customer goes to 2.4 different theater locations. So they want the ability last minute to make a decision and say, 
maybe I go over here, maybe I go over there. They're deciding that day based on what times the different movies will start, and it gives them that flexibility. And then the other benefit with movie pass is you still can have a loyalty program at those theaters and get your reward points for going there as well. So it's kind of a double win with movie pass versus being locked into only one theater circuit that you can get benefits from. All right, Stacy Spikes, thank you so much. I'm planning to watch Poor Things tonight, so I'm excited. I need to watch all my Oscar movies because we're, we're heading into award season very, very quickly with the Oscars coming up. So thank you again. You got it. Enjoy. And taking a look at shares of Occidental Petroleum here after hours. Company's fourth quarter results just crossing the wires here. So let's get to those. Mm -hmm. Q4 just EPS 74 cents. That's a beat. Street was closer to 67. Looking at net sales, 7.17 billion. That's also a beat. Consensus was around 6.84 billion. And looking ahead, it looks like they're calling for 2024 capex between 6.4 and 6.6 .6 billion, the estimate was close to 7 billion. And look, this is a favorite with Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha. He actually added to his position in Occidental Petroleum along with Chevron and Sirius XM. So you have the stamp of approval from Warren Buffett. And look, this is a company that's dealing with the same exposures as a broader energy landscape. We have oversupply in the oil market, those geopolitical concerns. And we've seen that reflected in the underperformance of shares. We're flat in after hours right now, but we're down about 3% since the start of the year. So should be an interesting company to continue to track especially with Buffett boosting his position there. Yeah, and then the acquisition of Crown Rock will, will be in focus, too. They announced that in December. It's about around $12 billion. Just, of course, just the flurry of deals, mm -hmm. deal-making consolidation we've seen in the energy sector has been a, been a big theme. Mm -hmm. Coming up, what to watch tomorrow. We're going to break down these stories you need to know to start your day.
Well, it's Valentine's Day and Americans are expected to spend $2.4 billion on candy alone, but it's costing more as cocoa futures have spiked. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma is here with the details. Brooke. Good afternoon to you both and happy Hi. Valentine's Ooh, Day. I know none of us are in red. <laughs> none or of us are in red, but it's okay. I, that's okay. It's Valentine's Day. But really what we're seeing here is the impact of cocoa futures soaring over 100% in the last year. And that's largely because of something we keep discussing, the impact of a climate pattern known as El Nino. And that's causing a lower supply of cocoa it's also impacting the supply of sugar and therefore we are seeing chocolate prices rise they're up 11 percent over the past year according to niq nielsen data and that's not going away experts telling yahoo finance that it's going to be a couple of years of elevated chocolate prices given the life cycle of trees that produce cocoa and the time it takes to plant new trees and then produce cocoa ultimately. But it's not really deterring customers here. We know that 57% of consumers plan to buy candy this holiday. That's the most that they're going to spend out of the other, other categories. And that's followed by things like typical things on Valentine's Day. You get greeting cards, yeah. flowers, an evening out and maybe some jewelry there as well. Hey, I, I mean, yeah, I vote jewelry, but I get candy, candy, <laughs> candy is always candy nice. Well, look, Definitely a bit of a lower price point too, totally, despite but, these jumps. <laughs> yeah, but, but these higher prices, they are impacting companies like Hershey's, Mondelez. They've actually been weighing in on how higher cocoa prices could impact their business. What have they been saying? Yeah, a big topic in this past earnings quarter, earnings season, you could say, prices for Hershey's North America, they jumped 7.2%. Ultimately, these companies taking higher prices because of these higher commodity costs. Hershey's exec said that cocoa is expected to limit earnings growth this year. They followed that by saying that the convection business is going to bear the brunt of the margin impact due to cocoa. Mondelez, a similar anecdote. They said that cocoa prices are an issue. They said they're well covered for the year, but interestingly enough, they said that they're going to have to take another price increase in Europe because they face more inflation than any other market there. But chocolate pricing playing into Mondelez's 2024 revenue guidance, that's also expected to increase in the higher end range of three to four percent but largely this is going to be baked in over the next year like i said these are these prices are going to remain elevated in the few coming years and so this is not going away so perhaps next valentine's day well We'll be talking about it again, guys. Not too sweet for these companies. <laughs> Not too sweet oh, at nice, all. Nice I, you know, I, 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 I pride She's myself. really playing into I this. I pride myself on my puns. <laughs> Brooke De Palma, thank you so much. Well, making financial decisions with your partner is not always simple and straightforward. More than one in four couples identifying money as their greatest relationship challenge, according to a recent study by Fidelity Investments. However, as you work through financial indifferences, there are some warning signs worth a double take. Here to discuss is Emily Irwin, Wells Fargo Managing Director and Senior Director of Advice. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. You told us some of the red flags to look out for when you think about your finances. Can you take through some of the top that come to mind? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, and happy Valentine's Day to everyone. So some of the big red flags that we see in relationships include things like financial secrecy. So this is really the red flag where someone is just not being transparent with their finances. It could be on their spending. It could be that they're hiding a debt on their balance sheet. It could be that they are not willing to discuss what even their career goals are with their partner. Another one would be taking on debt and just pretending it doesn't exist. And not all debt is bad debt. It could be that you've invested in yourself, you've taken on student loans, it could be that you're um, saving for a big purchase and you've taken out a mortgage or maybe an automobile to drive to that job that you need to get to. However, if you have no plan to pay it off or you're just kind of pretending it's not there, major red flag. Also behaviors like gambling. We just came off Super Bowl weekend. This can be a real indicator about kind of risk tolerance. You know, throwing down some money on whether or not Taylor Swift is there, mm -hmm. not a bad idea if you're spending your coffee money. If you're spending your rent money, that's a problem. And then finally, um, prioritizing wants over needs. Everyone should prioritize some splurge in order to maintain financial goals and good behaviors. But if you're doing that consistently and you can't pay off your monthly bills, then that's going to be a problem. So Emily, the one that got my attention as a potential red flag was gambling or, or betting. Because you know, a lot of people, Emily, they like sports betting. And by a lot of people, you know, I mean me. So when, when exactly is that, Emily, a, a red flag, a caution? Is, just, is it the amount you're spending? Is that it? It's actually not the amount. You want to think about what you're spending in alignment with your goals. And for someone, it might have one, two, three zeros 
that may not be something that's problematic if they can support it within their lifestyle and their budget. It is a problem if it affects things like you being able to make on-time payments of your bills, if it for some reason starts affecting your credit score, if for some reason it gets to the point where you're not even sharing those behaviors with your loved one and your partner, that's where the red flag comes in because that means you're starting to hide things that can not only affect your financial picture, but potentially your partner's as well. Yeah, Emily, the one that got me was financial secrecy or hiding things from your partner when it comes to your finances. What would be your advice to someone who might not feel comfortable discussing their credit score, for example, with their partner? Yeah, I think it depends on where you are in your relationship. Early on, you can do things like observe behaviors and kind of think to yourself, like, how does this person interact with their finances? You can ask about their money story. You can ask about, um, to tell them, about, like, all the things you want to do in a relationship. Tell me about yourself. Share what your money story is and your history so that it invites them to do the same. If you're a little bit further within the relationship, definitely before you take on any joint purchases or commingling of assets, you want to have a really transparent conversation about kind of the big things, saving, spending, debt. How are we going to check in with one another? A wonderful way to do it. It's Valentine's Day. Do it over a date night in a place that's not going to be something that's emotionally charged. You both know you're coming into that conversation. You know what the topic is. And therefore, you're going to be able to be in an environment where you can have a more transparent, less emotional conversation. All right. Those are good tips, financial and otherwise. Emily, thank you so much for joining the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. Time now for it to watch Thursday, February 15th, starting off on the earnings front. Deer, DoorDash, DraftKings, Coinbase, and Stellantis all reporting earnings tomorrow. DoorDash reporting fourth quarter earnings after the close. That stock is up about 20% to start the year, but drivers for the company is striking today, demanding better pay and safer working conditions. Turning now to the economy, retail sales data from the Census Bureau coming out tomorrow ahead of the open. Economists forecasting sales in the U.S. to fall in January. And we'll also get the weekly reading on mortgage rates, which have been hovering in the mid-6% range. Housing will be a focus as the spring home buying season gets underway. And finally, we're expecting another round of commentary from Fed officials. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic and Fed Governor Christopher Waller both speaking tomorrow. This coming after the hot inflation reading earlier this week that shocked markets. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby saying today, let's not get amped up about the report yesterday, Allie. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be closely following tomorrow because it was yeah. just interesting to hear those comments from Goolsby. He did say, I don't support waiting until inflation on a 12-month basis has achieved 2% to begin cutting. So the messaging there is that cuts are going to come. The big question, though, for investors is when and how many cuts are we going to see throughout the year? So that's going to be something that I think if Raphael Bostic, Christopher Waller, if they can elaborate on that, I think markets will be watching that very closely. Yeah, it was interesting hear about uh, Goolsby just kind of saying, take a breath. Don't what, get amped up. Yeah, <laughs> don't get amped up. All right, I'm going to be looking at DoorDash. Now, they announced Q4 results tomorrow, Allie, after mm -hmm. market close. The stock up about 90% in the past 12 months. It's about 20% already this year. Analysts kind of split on this one. 20 buys, 18 holds, one sell. Average price target right now is about 115. Now, Uber did recently report results. They talked about their delivery business and how they were sort of taking share in their top markets. I did see some analysts saying they don't think they took share from DoorDash specifically, but I guess we'll find out when they report tomorrow. Yeah, I think guidance is going to be a big focus here. We saw a lot of improvements in 2023. Moffat Nathanson actually said sentiment has flipped from a perception of a post-COVID loser mm. to an internet darling. Yeah, so, loser to darling. Loser to yeah, darling. That's that's, nice. that's, that's a pretty a big boat of confidence there. So I think uh, guidance is going to be a big focus there, and, and we'll see if revenue can surprise to the upside as or well. Or a lot of DoorDash. You use DoorDash? I, I do, unfortunately, I order a lot of DoorDash. It's aggressive how much DoorDash <laughs> in the Lipton house. <laughs> It's, it's bad. You know. It's bad. <laughs> That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after closing bell.